Welcome back to Research Collective's Healthcare Human Factors Engineering videos. My name is Russ Brannigan. Today I'm going to provide a simple introduction to the FDA Human Factors Guidance. I really want to emphasize this word simple because simplicity itself enables us to reduce uncertainty and, and this is clearly a situation where you want to reduce uncertainty. Indeed, the facts are pretty simple. Reducing errors made by people using your medical device can save lives. Too many people are injured or die every year because of medical products that are too difficult to use. Also, ensuring that your medical product reduces the likelihood of these errors makes it easier to gain FDA approval or FDA clearance depending on your submission pathway. FDA has recognized the safety benefits of human factors for many years now. In 2000, CDRH released a guidance document describing how human factors should be incorporated into risk management. Then over the next 10 years, FDA established a human factors engineering group. Their job was to evaluate the human factors engineering evidence provided by medical device manufacturers in their application. In 2000, a human factors guidance was introduced. It emphasized the importance of considering user capabilities and limitations and use scenarios when designing devices to ensure safety. In 2011, FDA published a draft human factors guidance for medical devices, and this document clarified many of the steps manufacturers needed to complete when preparing for uh, their submission to FDA. It described how manufacturers should implement human factors into their risk management and how to prepare and conduct validation usability studies. This was accepted as a final guidance in 2016. In 2022, FDA published the draft guidance content of human factors information and medical device marketing submissions. The purpose of this document was to complement and provide some clarifications to the existing 2016 guidance document. Human factors engineers like to simplify things, so we developed this graphic to divide the process into three main steps, and each step has sub-steps. The remainder of this presentation describes how to perform each of these steps. As you can see here, the three major steps are one, identify, two, formative usability process, and three, validation. So let's start by focusing on step one, identify, and let's focus on what we're identifying to begin with. First, we need to identify and characterize all of the device users. Are they patients? Are they caregivers? Are they physicians or nurses or techs or therapists? There's any number of people who may be end users of a product. It's not just the patient and it's certainly not just the caregiver. There's a, a whole litany of people we need to pay attention to. And for those types of people, we should be paying attention to their capabilities, their attitudes, their behaviors, their literacy, for example, even their le level of training, because these things have important implications for how we design the product, at what level we assume knowledge, and, and so forth. So identifying the product's user is critical to design. So for example, I design a device very differently for the healthcare professional on the left than I would for the elderly person on the right. I find it helpful to identify users through a series of questions. So example questions are things like who purchases the device, who receives it, who unpacks the device, who sets it up, who uses the device, who cleans or reprocesses the device, who disposes of the device. And one of the things I've noticed is that questions like who cleans or reprocesses the device don't get addressed often until really late in the design process, and that's a problem. As you may know, reprocessing medical equipment can be really difficult and can lead to frankly, catastrophic outcomes if not done correctly. So this needs to be included in our analysis of our users. Another set of questions can help identify each user's characteristics, abilities, and limitations, things like that. So do they have physical or cognitive limitations? What's their level of education? Do they have any specialized training? Uh, often we think about things like what their emotional state is uh, when they're using the device. For example, are they in a state of panic sometimes because the device is used and really only a state of emergency. The device's use environment influences many aspects of its design as well. So a simple example would be the different design considerations for devices used in surgery versus the ones used at home. So when we describe the use environment, we often ask questions like, 
Where is the device used? Is it used in the home? Is it used in a clinical environment? Is it used in uh, surgery or someplace like that, an ambulatory environment? What's the lighting like? What's the noise like? Are there lots of interruptions? What's the flooring like? Can you move things around easily on the flooring? What's the temperature in the room? How many people are in the environment? How much space do users have? Is it cluttered? And uh, questions like that, all of which have important implications for the design of the product. Next, we identify and describe all of the user interface components that users interact with. So user interfaces usually are thought to mean things like graphical user interfaces on screens and infusion pumps and things like that. But all things that the user comes into contact with are really part of the device's user interface. So it's really much broader than what you see on your screen. It includes the packaging, training materials, instructions for use, all types of labeling, uh, buttons, knobs, levers, pedals, all of those kinds of things, as well as the graphical user interface. So as a result, it really is a good accounting of everything that the user comes into contact with to make sure every single component of it is particularly easy to use. The next step is to identify known use-related hazards. So the FDA wants manufacturers to show that they're aware of any use-related issues present in similar or predicate devices and that the device is being developed, that is being developed, I should say, does not repeat the same mistakes. So you can get a lot of that information, of course, from previous versions of this product, predicate devices, uh, customer complaints that you've heard through time, uh, complaints and input that you've gotten through training and sales staff and, and folks like that. But the Human Factors guidance also provides a list of other sources where these kinds of issues can be found out. These include, here's a list as a matter of fact, the FDA's Manufacturer and User Facility Device Experience Database, otherwise known as, as MOD, FDA's MedSun Medical Product Safety Network, CDRH's Medical Device Recalls, the FDA Safety Communications, ECRI's Medical Device Safety Reports, the Institute of Safe Medical uh, Practices, Medication Safety Alert Newsletters, and the Joint Commission Sentinel Events. So that's a good list of things to check as you are scouring the literature for critical, uh, or actually I should say for known issues. The last part of step one is to identify the device's critical tasks. You can think of device use as being broken out into uh, discrete steps or sequences of tasks, but not all of these tasks are created equal. Specifically, some are more important than others. The most important tasks we call critical tasks. Critical tasks are those that, if not performed correctly, could lead to harm to the patient or the user. It's important to note that harm can mean delay or lack of therapy. So failure to perform a task correctly or not at all is called a use error. So notice here we don't call it a user error. One of the commandments of human factors is to never blame the user. So we attribute all blame to the design of the device, user interface, and attempt to minimize these task failures through good design. So we identify all of the tasks that include setup and takedown and storage and all of those kinds of things. And out of those, we identify critical, critical tasks. And those are ones that can cause harm to the patient or user or delay in therapy. One example of an obvious critical task is found in Syncardia System's Total Artificial Heart. In the event of a complete heart failure, the Syncardia Total Artificial Heart can be implanted in place of the two ventricles and serve as a bridge to transplant. Air is pumped into the artificial heart by an external driver through tubes called drive lines. In the event that the external driver fails, the patient needs to be detached from the faulty driver and connected to a new driver. Obviously, this swap needs to be done really quickly as the patient's blood stops circulating as soon as the pump is disconnected. Like I said, this is an easily identifiable critical task. But what about a task like this? In this case, the important part is that the injection be delivered straight into the skin at a 90 degree angle. Injecting the needle at an angle other than that won't necessarily harm the user, but the full dose in that case wouldn't be delivered. So that maybe that's okay for some drugs, but for other drugs, not getting the full dose could be a matter of life or death. 
So you can see it's important to look at each task individually and determine the potential outcome of each task if performed incorrectly. Step two is a formative usability process. Simply put, the formative usability process is design, evaluate, and repeat. The only way to know if things that are being developed can be used by users is to actually get them in the hands of the users. This iterative approach can save a lot of time and money. The idea is to evaluate interface elements in prototype form. Individual components, things like instructions for use and handle shape, information architecture, and so on could all be evaluated individually. So in formative testing, the key is to perform small formative usability evaluations while the product is being developed. So rather than waiting until the entire device is ready to go, you evaluate individual components as they become available. As you can imagine, it's a lot easier to implement the changes found in the design while it's still pliable in early prototype form. There are various research methods that can be used to obtain this user input uh, that'll fit the need at the time. We can bring users in to interview them about their tasks. We can show them models, get feedback about a few different design ideas, and so on. We could visit users to observe them in their natural habitats. We could watch them perform their duties, maybe present them with a new prototype and watch them use it. We could conduct a heuristic evaluation. That's an expert review performed by human factor specialists, where we look at your product or instructions for use or training or any number of other things and determine how well it meets good design guidelines or heuristics. Once we have a usable prototype, we can then have users perform real tasks in a simulated use usability study. The good thing about these formative studies is we don't need all that many participants. We usually recommend including about five to seven users and we expect to find the majority of usability issues. Since we know the successful performance of critical tasks is ultimately what will determine the device's standing with the FDA, we focus on the designing and evaluating those first. We wanna make sure that we're confident that users can perform those critical tasks. It's also a good time to get valuable feedback about users' needs and desires. We have them there to evaluate a product, but while we have them there, we can learn all sorts of things that can help with the design of other products, marketing, branding, competitive products, and so on. Lastly, we can use formative studies to prepare for the validation usability study. Some tasks are pretty difficult to simulate. They require props, mannequins, special codes to trigger events or actors, so it's a good idea to work out all the kinks during the formative studies so that the validation testing goes off without a hitch. Step three is validation usability testing. This is really the culmination of the human factors process. The goal here is to demonstrate that the device can be used without serious use errors. So there's a few characteristics that are pretty important to this particular phase. One is it must include the final design of the device and the final labeling. It must include all interface elements that will be available. You need to provide realistic training if it's applicable here. We assume that you'll use 15 representative, representative participants per user group. And remember, one group could be doctors, another could be nurses, another could be patients. So that would be 15 in each of those. We assume that you will test all critical tasks and you'll use realistic simulated use scenarios and there will be absolutely no leading the witness that is the participant here. The data collected will include the observation of participant performance, knowledge task comprehension, so situations where uh, a person was supposed to know something that would be very important for the use of the device uh, to use it safely. We want to make sure they actually understand what it is they're doing, so there will be knowledge questions and qualitative interview responses, especially after somebody's had some difficulty. It's helpful to know what that difficulty was caused by. That's very helpful for understanding the root cause. The performance, knowledge, and qualitative data are all analyzed and compiled in a detail, actually in a detailed results table. The table describes each use error that was observed and the surrounding details that led to the error what users said about it, and what they did to help determine the root cause. The root cause is ultimately what determines which component of the user interface was responsible for the use error. Again, the root cause shouldn't be something like the user wasn't paying attention, or the user was distracted, or the user was ignorant. The rest of the table describes the potential harm and risk 
control measures that may be taken to mitigate the risk. If the formative usability process was done correctly, it's possible that this table could be pretty much empty. However, if there's a use error on a critical task, that doesn't necessarily mean the device cannot pass muster with the FDA. It always comes down to the level of risk associated with any use error. That's why it's important to provide the context, the explanation, for all observed use errors. All of this goes into a human factors engineering, or, or usability engineering, I should say, report. So, in that report, make sure to follow the guidelines provided in the FDA guidance. It'll include a conclusion, descriptions of intended users, uses, use environments, training, and so on, a description of the device user interface, a summary of known use problems, an analysis of the hazards and risks associated with the device, a summary of preliminary analyses and evaluations, a description and categorization of critical tasks, and then the details of the human factors validation testing. So now let's talk about post-market surveillance. Hopefully you've completed all that was required by the FDA and your device is now on the market. What's next? Well, that's post-market usability surveillance. So passing the validation usability testing doesn't mean your device is perfect, of course. Instead, you should monitor and document critical incident reports for issues related to usability. You should conduct field visits to observe the device in use. That's very important. You should talk to actual users in the field, and now is the time to create a design wish list for version 2 and beyond. So that is a simple introduction to the FDA Human Factors Guidance. It's three steps. We start by identifying the device users, the device use environment, its user interfaces, any known issues uh, that are out there, and making sure we identify critical tasks. The second part is we conduct formative usability process. That includes usability testing of a formative kind where we're using, say, five to seven participants per test and iterating to make sure that we've identified all of the usability issues and kind of uh, mitigated the, as many of them as we possibly can. And then third, validation testing. In that particular case, we're usually using about 15 participants per user group, and of course, user groups can vary. You may have three or four different user groups, one being nurses, another being physicians, for example, another being caregivers, another being users uh, or patients, actually. Uh, so 15 participants per user group uh, to actually conduct a usability test where they're doing real honest-to-goodness tasks in a simulated use environment with the product and the real honest-to-goodness uh, materials, instructions for use, and so forth. From that, we create a usability and Human Factors Engineering Report, which is submitted to FDA. So we hope you find this helpful. I hope you found it uh, particularly simple as a good overview to this. And the best way to uh, get good at this is to just jump in and do it. If you need assistance, we're happy to help. Feel free to contact us at Research Collective at research-collective.com. And I will look forward to talking to you next time.